Hi, Colin Marshall here, letting you know that you can now read a new essay from my upcoming book, A Los Angeles Primer, each and every week at KCET Departures. For details, visit colinmarshall.org. Thanks. Season 3 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Carl Haley and Daniel Murphy. For some reason, it seems like a priority to me when I'm in Vancouver to buy pocket squares while I'm here. You're the one to know. Where do I go? Uh, well, I, I used to go with the upgraded pocket square. I used to, you know, I, I think Harry Rosen's is an obvious place. Holt Rent Fruit, which I love. And I, more, more importantly, I kind of really favor the kerchief right now. Mm. Uh, I think that's the real way to go. Anything more fancy, you know, uh, than that. And, and now I want to hand roll my own. So I'm very crafty. I'm turning into a very crafty person. The more I spend time writing alone in my apartment, I think the more time I think about all the wild, crazy, weird things I can make. Mm. I, I want to make shoes. Mm. I, I nearly, I, I'm not really sure what the, the obsession is, but I, I, I did think about designing my own prints, mm. uh, getting my own uh, fabric screens, and like uh, creating pocket squares. But I would say those are the two. And, you know, you're American, so... I, I'm kind of in love with Brooks Brothers, mm. but I think right now I'm wearing like a five and dime kind of pocket square of Australian birds. Oh, look at that. They're really a kerchief. Uh -huh. And I'm really favoring the little, so any, I think the cheaper the better now. I'm, right. I, you know, the hand rolling and all that, whatever, it doesn't matter. This is just, uh, actually, this is hand rolled. But anyways, <laughs> uh, the point is that I'm not so fussy. I think, you know, I'm also a, a big believer in the paper pocket square now. Oh, the I paper get, pocket either, square. I get my children uh, to uh, draw. Mm -hmm. So for a special occasion, I'll tell them, look, I'm going to do a blah, blah, blah. I need you to make me a pocket square. And they'll get an eight and a half, eleven sheet of typewriter paper and get the markers out and create something. Mm -hmm. And then they'll crush it into a tiny little ball so it's soft. Yes. And then I'll fold it up and put it on and it always looks great. Oh. So you could save yourself a lot of money when you come to Vancouver by not uh, spending too much in pocket squares. Mm. It is Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall coming to you from the Dr. Sun Yat-sen Gardens in Chinatown, Vancouver, British Columbia, sitting down with J.J. Lee, who has written and spoken about menswear for the Vancouver Sun, the National Post, CBC Radio. He also wrote the book recently, uh, The Measure of a Man, the story of a father, a son, and a suit. And in, in your pocket, on your suit, I noticed you, you, you do... You use your kind of a TV fold there, is that not? Or, well, how yeah, did you decide yeah, on that? I, yes, it is kind of a TV fold. It's just a plain old square that you just plunk in. Right. But I'm very... The, all the precision that's been going into pocket squares lately, I've become quite the rebel. And mm. I'm a real believer uh, of um, Russell Smith's concept, yes. who wrote um, Men's Style, a great fine writer, Canadian writer. Mm. And he said, close your eyes, shove it in, it's good to go. <laughs> uh, so uh, like kudos to him. <laughs> Now, it's a friend of mine who lives there, who lives here, um, calls this a false start summer, where it seems like it's summer, but it's going to get cold again. It seems like you're already wearing a suit for a slightly warmer time. Is that true? I've been dying to wear linen. I, uh, I'm very... I'm fascinated by summer suiting. And, I, and by that, I mean non-wool summer suiting. Right. So seersucker and linen and the khaki suit. And I'm really fascinated... Uh, in particular by what I call blown linen. Hmm. It's been an obsession for around a year and a half, two years. Well, how did it become an obsession? I'm not really sure. I think it's because I've always liked denim. Hmm. And I want to, to find a way or find that expression of the worn and weathered suit. Hmm. And of course, a wool suit, I, I, I personally think tweed can look quite beautiful with patches, hmm. elbow patches, even holes in it that have been closed again. And not rewoven, but just clumsily done hmm with thread if, if one has to or find someone to do it for them mm. um, so I'm a really I'm a big believer in that sort of heavily distressed wear it till it falls apart kind yeah. of school of dress now and I didn't think I would be because I don't particularly like ripped jeans right. or things with intentional holes in it mm. uh, but I found that especially when pre-bought yeah, exactly. And and so I'm very like, yeah, for example, on the other end of it, I, I want raw denim, right? That's my other fascination. But I'm really interested in that summer summer suiting that's so beautiful and can show wrinkles and just, and even, um, you know how the seam on a lapel is turned in? Mm -hmm. So you don't actually see the face fabric and the back fabric coming together because mm -hmm. it's sort of hidden by the lapel. Right. But that seam that's there, that sort of hidden seam, 
and a blown suit begins to, to pop open. You get to oh, see this see. edge that meets each other. It becomes visible. Yeah, so the face and the inside come together with a funny little fold, right? Mm-hmm. And that, and I want to start seeing that sort of. So I, I want to get it a head start. And I, mm-hmm. so it's uh, here I, we are, uh, only in very early spring, and, but it's the first warm day uh, this year, and I'm wearing black linen. Vancouver is the only city in Canada that allows you to wear it, though, really, weather, weather-wise, right? I mean, Toronto gets maybe too hot for it. Or Montreal, better, a better comparison. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, now, if you're talking about black linen specifically, I suppose, yes. Like, I, I'm not really... Like, the only reason I'm wearing black linen is because it's the only one I have right now. Um, my real fantasy, though, is that cerulean blue linen that sort of TV linen. Mm. And the reason why I call it TV blue is because it looks gorgeous on television. It, mm. it doesn't, it's not that dark blue that looks great because it, you might think it's black on television, mm. but it's that blue that reads as blue. And I'm right. looking for that sort of more plain, straight, not sky blue, but you know, that very medium blue that, that shows the fabric, that mm. shows the, uh, the linen weave and slubbing if there's any and uh that that so so i'm wearing the black you know not because i think it's ideal for vancouver but because it's the only thing i i have right now but it almost but, looks not black it's, i threw it in the wash oh, see okay. so this is the other part of the mission is that to get that blown look i've been right. throwing this suit into the wash right. and then it actually becomes undersized mm. and linen isn't quite as giving as let's say denim mm. but uh so there used to be a lot of lines going around my waistline because of the pressure of closure uh, of the because it was tight. But now it's sort of loosened again, like a, the way um, a pair of jeans would if, right. you, if you wore it consistently enough. So I've threw it in the wash twice now. It's paled out, mm. so it's beginning to have a bit more of an indigo re- reading as indigo or mm. purple, mm. and uh, so that's I'm interested in that. Right. So it's not I don't want a perfect color right. to the suit. I, I mean. No, God forbid that I would want sweat stains on it. <laughs> but something like that, like that kind of weathering, like I'm, I'm open to the possibility right. of it being like that. Right. It's, I, I should take that tip because personally, I can't really wear black with my own coloring. Mm. You're able to. Let's, let's say this. Writing about menswear, you're writing about fit, but you're also writing more about color than maybe people would expect, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean... I don't know how other people think about menswear or write about it, but I suppose I really think of it in the photogenic sense. Mm. And maybe that's because of my training in painting as a painter. I'm always looking for color or ways of having color play a role in in the suit and how it works with people. And I'm not that, you know, I'm not your fall, your winter, your <laughs> summer, your spring. I'm not really one of those people, but I do love exploring color. Mm. Now, at the same time, I'm quite conservative because I think that I, I only look good in dark ties. I would never wear a light colored tie. I just think, except for my, I have a Liberty um, Paisley, which I love, a vintage. Mm. It's so beautiful. So I wear that. It's mm. got a little pink and a bit of the, uh, that sky blue and yellow, golden yellow. And with black lines to mark out the paisley shape, uh, but otherwise I'm pretty strict. But at the same time, like you know, I'll wear garish socks. Like I'm getting to the point where uh, I don't want my socks even to match. Right. You know, um, like that's it's just beginning. Like I just want to find a way of right. having the, you know. So the suit for me is really a basis for right. all that sort of flamboyance. That sort of hidden flamboyance, whether it's the shirt or a socks or your pocket square, even your tie. But like I said, I right. just, I just know a dark tie looks best on me, mm. so I stick with it. Um, so the but, more conservative the form of the suit, the more flamboyance you think you can allow yourself in the other areas. Yeah, I, I do. I do for. See, I'm a terrible person to seek advice from because I'm becoming like one of those people that wear weird clothes. I'm getting there. Like, you know, I'm wearing um, a tasseled uh, Johnson and Murphy loafers mm. with uh, with a wing uh, with wing uh, wing tips and broguing. And it's, it's got everything. It's got yeah, yeah, it's got everything on it. And you know, nobody wears like I mean, so you know, girls wear it. Like the young women, the hipster women are wearing it right now. But I don't see a lot of you know, maybe lawyers. You know, some sort of big heavy set man uh, might be wearing it these days. But uh, it's just I'm getting quirky. Like I'm getting like I'm nearly getting to the edge of not being able to help people because I've become so idiosyncratic in my own dressing. But I really uh, love it, and I, and I really encourage like because men are getting smart about how to dress. 
Like Are we that, say getting smart again? They're getting smart again. I would say yes. Like, you know, like it, there's been enough seasons of Mad Men. Uh, there's been enough. Even the department stores are bringing out skinny suits uh, now, right? Like you can find a two and a half inch tie. You can find a two inch tie now. And so everybody's doing it. Everyone's looking correct, mm. right? And that's yeah. what's driving me nuts. And, and I'm too much of a, you know, I wore a bow tie starting probably in 2003. Mm. Um, it's, been a, it's been a while actually. And. And so I think I'm getting cranky and I'm getting a bit uh, funny about dress now. But but I also encourage other people to d- get that way to, because I think we're ready for, you know, that sort of wide open, knowledgeable, but not adhering to the laws, you know, the rules that we've accumulated and published and written about and found in the magazines. And I think it's time for another, a real peacock flowering. Mm-hmm. Not one that's as self-conscious in some ways as the ones that occurred in the late 60s, but maybe just a real wide-open, postmodern suit wearing. I mean, I, this is something that I embrace as well, but why did we get stupid? How did we get stupid is a very good question. I mean, I'm not a historian of the 70s, let's put it that way. But most certainly, I got caught in the casual Friday. Oh, yeah. uh, I, I became working age in the in the rise of the khaki pant Mm. and those great ads by the gap and those Annie Leibovitz photographs and uh, it informed how we thought that's how people dress and you know it was the dot com and all that stuff the bubble people you know uh, CEOs or art directors walking around in jeans and t-shirts and backs were you know baseball caps right Mm -hmm. and I and they still do (laughs) and uh, and I just think we just lost it and and we didn't see any role models and we, we didn't want suits. We really didn't want suits because suits did, funny enough, my own dislike of suits occurred at the same time that my father and I, which I write about in my book, uh, having trouble with each other in the 90s. The suits represented everything that went wrong, mm. right, in the culture. That's whole Wall the Street suit rose. That guy is a suit. He is a suit. He is a suit. And then we didn't want to be suits. And so we, we threw everything out that came along with it. And it took a decade to even come back to the suit. And thank God for Eddie Slaman and uh, Dior Ohm and what he did there. And then later on at Yves Saint Laurent. Um, was he Yves Saint Laurent? Or is he Yves Saint Laurent now? Ah, anyways, correct me. Uh, correct me, I'm wrong. He, uh, you know, thank God for Eddie Slaman uh, when he came to Dior Ohm and, and brought that suit out. And it showed us that a suit could be rock and roll. Mm. And it could be something else. And it could be really vital. And I think... Uh, I don't think I could have written Measure of a Man or began my exploration in my father's history and tried to alter my father's suit without, without Eddie Slaman, actually. It's really funny that I would have to, 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 to nod my head to him, but I suppose I do. Now, we'll talk a little bit about this book. For those who aren't familiar with it, The Measure of a Man is, I, I call it a men's, menswear memoir, and I don't see too many of those because it's the story of you and your father, especially your father's life story, and the story of the suit as well because your father was a suit wearer and you have become one tell me when did you i mean i'm reading this book you know your your father has such a quick rise so successful so young and then such a dramatic fall in your in your writing did you see a dramatic narrative of his life uh even when he was alive did you sense this this guy is living the kind of life that people write about do do you know what i mean like so quick and so quickly rise so quickly risen and so long and painfully fallen it was a long and painful fall and and I recognized the arc of his life mm. what I couldn't see or understand is that it was a story to tell mm. and even feeling the permission to tell it I'm, I mean I'm a true coward I've told other people that like you know I only started thinking of him as a subject to consider in writing and in my work uh, after he died mm. and um I'm kind of ashamed of that sometimes like when I really you know and when I'm alone and this is a bit quiet I do think of the, the how hard that was and maybe I don't know what it, it what how transgressive the act of writing has been but uh, yes and now in retrospect he was a fascinating Dodi Kravitz like character a Growing up in St. Urban Street. comparison, I like that. Yeah, you know, growing up in St. Urban, uh, wanting land. He really did want land. He wanted stuff, right? Wow. And to, to, to define him. And then just burning out and falling apart uh, from that sort of normative desire, that sort of wanting to be successful in the most narrow of terms. Right. The most 
normative, narrow way of being successful. And it crushed him because it, I found out after he died, he played guitar, he liked mm. to draw, all the things that I do now. Wow. He he did. And I never knew that. Like, he never sat me down, on, you know, and played the guitar for me. Mm. You know, I didn't know that he, he had any interest in anything like that. Even after reading and enjoying your book and hearing all, learning all this about your father, I still have a little bit of the question, like, what exactly happened to him? Uh, how was he, I mean, I, the, there was the drinking, uh, there, was, there was the losing the one job, but again, the guy seems poised for success and even says, they still seem like words of wisdom because I guess I'm a clothes guy. If you have $1,000, spend it on clothes, not food, because you'll always be successful if you have clothes. You know, I read that and think, that's a wise man, but then you describe him as just plummeting you know it's i think i'm sure you still have the question of what happened to him no one knows right well i really do believe he was undiagnosed depressive and 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 he medic self-medicated through alcohol uh, vast amounts of it and there's just you can't you can't stop that you can't get around that like he did he applied that medicine on himself and it destroyed him. And there's no turning back from it once you really get going. I mean, of course there is. But he never sought help. He never diagnosed himself as an alcoholic. He never admitted you know, to anyone or acknowledged his alcoholism. And it destroyed him. And, and um, I think that confrontation, it just, wasn't, it just couldn't have happened. There was no one to stop that momentum. There was no one to just... It, look, I've never taken drugs. And I never will. Because I know it just takes one it, it just takes one step in the wrong direction and it, if it's a hill, a steep, steep hill, you will go down it and it will go down and it will be a long slide. Mm. So uh, not that I'm a straight and narrow guy or anything like that, but uh, when I see, when I look at my father's life, you, you can't take lightly things that hurt your body or make you um, not happy. Mm. And so drinking, he was already unhappy, and then he drank, and then he sought oblivion through drink, and then it made him more unhappy. And so it became self-fulfilling kind of destiny at that point. There was no way around it. He was going to... He was... I'll tell you something I learned mm. since writing the book. And it's really... It's profound to me. And it, I, I acknowledge to that my understanding of dress and clothing comes with a great acknowledgement that people are aesthetic beings like really aesthetic like we get up in the morning and we look in the mirror and we try to do something that's like making art no argument here all right even if we're if it's just trying to avoid being noticed right we're trying to create an aesthetic every day every day so we live our lives uh trying to create aesthetic moments you know the great marriage proposal the perfect meal yeah like we, these are all aesthetic judgments these are not quantifiable things right so one thing we do is we adopt narratives and this is what I tell I talk to high school students about memoir writing and I tell them a lot of people a lot adopt negative memoirs tragedy right there's only two forms of st storytelling the comedy and the tragedy and then there's melodrama which never ends because it's television <laughs> yes but the tragedy requires one thing of the hero their death mm. And if you adopt um, a tragedy, if your aesthetic sensibility drives you towards tragedy, it's not going to be a good ending for you. Mm. And so I think my father had adopted a tragic narrative for his life. Mm. And, will, you know, knowingly or not, his life became, you know, started to fall into place so that that decline would work. And even if it's subconscious and not intentional, he created a negative narrative for himself, and it, and it demanded his his passing. Wow. It could have happened ten years now. It could have happened, you know, last year or ten years from now. Even it did the, when he when he died it didn't really matter. Mm. But it was that long slide, and so I really encourage. And my outlook in life is very positive because it, um, I want because I want that joy. I, I want mm. the opposite of what my father had in his life, and and so. That's the, the most powerful thing about this journey is I've learned about in that aesthetic judgment. The thing that makes us want to wear clothes nicely is also the thing that makes us decide whether our life is going to be tragic or comic. And I suppose I want my life to be a comedy. And one of the things that I found most hard to believe about your father's story, the decline, is that dressing, dressing well, you write, is so important to him. And then at the end, 
Sure, he doesn't have money, and he's, he's drinking a lot, but he starts dressing badly, and he, he has one suit left by the end, and it's the suit you alter in the book, and you describe the suit in terms that make it sound a bit strange, not the suit he would have worn earlier in life. How do you think it is that he even let the dressing go? Was it just the, that narrative, all part of it? He has to look bad as well? That's an interesting question. I've never really thought of it that way. I suppose you do hunker down, and you can sort of settle into a much more... Uh, slovenly self-image and it it's not necessarily a bad thing like uh, I'm a real grease monkey I, I, I fix bikes and I'm swapping out chain rings all the time and doing stuff like that and all, you know building frames and I get really really messy and one of my favorite things to wear are actually a pair of white pants with grease black <laughs> grease stains all up and down it uh, and that you know to me that's just I just love it so um, is it it, did he lose himself? Or I think it reflected the way he felt about himself. That's the most important thing to understand about that decline. But also, the circumstances didn't call for it anymore. Mm. And I think dressing is ultimately a situational thing. Mm. That uh, you know, we're always looking for the right look, for the right moment. Right. So when, when he was the best connected restaurant, uh, connected. The best connected man in the restaurant community of Montreal, that's one thing when you're sort of drifting, quite another. Yeah, when you're working, yeah, when you're like taking uh, wings noodles and throwing them into a pan with, uh, with, uh, with chicken balls and, and, and onions, you know, you're not going to, you're just not the same man yeah, anymore. No doubt. You know, you're a different person. And so he did that. He, you know, he was slinging chow mein out of, uh, out of a bad restaurant in, next to a strip bar, and that was kind of a rough thing. So uh, he dressed differently. But funny enough, like he did start dressing up again when he did. You know, one of his last jobs in Montreal was as a food and beverage manager at the Chateau Champlain, which is one of those lovely CP hotels that we have in Canada. And uh, he did dress up, but then the marriage fell apart, and then it, of course it, be, it started another decline. Also, you, you have to. I think we have to acknowledge that at a certain age. A snappy dresser of a particular age is wearing the clothes of when he was a snappy dresser. And so he became, you know, I think all men, you know, do become a bit flash frozen in time. Jerry Seinfeld has a line, all men dress in the last good year of their lives. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's exactly what happened with my father then, I would say. And so there were some items in this closet uh, when he passed away that were clearly about him assembling a wardrobe that sort of resembled what he had when we were wealthier. Uh, and he still had a sensibility, but he just didn't care anymore, and it wasn't called for. And I don't begrudge him that at all. I don't think he was a failure in terms of dress. I mean, he knew a lot about clothes, uh, and and it was kind of admirable. But he just didn't care, and we, you know, and he was just becoming a middle-aged Chinese guy with a lot of problems, right? Mm. And uh, and it just it, his life didn't call for it. He could still go to a business meeting. He could still do it. I just never saw it. It was we were no longer on the same path we, wow. we were we lived 20 minutes when he died we lived 20 minutes away and i had not seen him in a year when he died and so that's the kind of how strange we are we were and so that's i mean that's what i ended up with with this, this stuff i had never seen before in an apartment i had never seen going through a closet and then holding on to this one suit and thinking and then i don't know i got the cock cockamamie idea of trying to alter it and, I, and that so that's the you know that to and froing my life story and that battle and that discussion with the suit was really it was a very enlightening experience and journey the the suit that you alter in the book that that gives you that narrative tell tell me about that suit it's reading your description it seemed like it was a, a bit late 80s dated not not a suit you would wear for yourself not a suit like the ones your father used to wear what what was this suit like i mean i described it very well in the book and so it's yes. frozen so i hope you don't mind if i repeat myself Go for it. this suit um this suit was a faux Armani cut yeah. with a low notch, that's that low notch that drops far below the clavicle. And so the center of gravity, Armani in the 80s, Richard Gere, American Gigolo, the certain gravity fell upon the suit and really all the directional lines went towards the pelvis. It was really about the thrust of the hips forward, mm -hmm. you know, and it was a very sexual kind of suit. You had to have a certain body for it. But that, that look, that low swaying nature, came and 
sort of permeated through, you know, Miami Vice and all the clothes that you saw. And even in, in Wall Street, there's a sort of a low slung nature to the clothes on Michael Douglas. Uh, though Alan Fluster is a, a beautiful clothes maker and I would not disparage anything that, that he does. And you can still sort of dress like Gordon Gecko and get away with it. Not fully. Oh, you know, I mean, you, you, you can like just look at anyone who's a fan of Hugo Boss. There's that sort of heavy set swagger as if the bottom the hem of the jacket is supposed to swing still mm. there's always that I, I just I don't know why it's never disappeared it's still there you can still see it in some of the Italian tailoring too uh, and that's very lovely so don't get me wrong but for my father it was just it was a misery and 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 the ersatz a suit that he found like this sort of hand-me-down Armani you could say you know fourth generation bad photocopy of Armani he had to know uh, what was wrong with it. I don't know if he did. I mean, like he, like you know, he was um, the precision, precision that we we're in a post menswear f- time. The precision by which we understand menswear now is nothing like how people used to understand it. I am certain of it. I am certain. It's so it's sort of like we're the we are the archaeologists, those German archaeologists that are running around digging up pyramids in Egypt. Is, is we, that you know, like digging up, you know, uh, Roman uh, Greek temples. Yeah. We're kind of like you know, they're, oh, the Greeks never measured it, right. you know, but we do. Like we'll measure the column and you know know exactly where the column's belly gets wide, you know? Yeah. You know, oh, it's a Doric and it's Ionian and it's a, you know, and, and so we're like that now. Like, I think a young man, a man of a certain generation have be, all of a sudden become crazy savvy. Mm-hmm. And so if, if you really talk to an old-time tailor, mm-hmm. they might know some of the things that you talk about because of our, of our book learning around right. dress, but they actually some of the stuff they don't know. Oh, I see. So we're, we're like maybe Renaissance scholars going back to the Greek texts. And going, and saying and going like, all psycho on it, <laughs> like getting all mathematic, like, oh, it's got to be a two-inch because your, cause your chin is this wide and your ears are so flappy, so it has your your tie needs to be this wide. Like, you have to recover the knowledge. Yeah, yeah. And it's like it was a knowledge that was never really there. It was just really an eyeballing culture. Right. It was an eyeball. Mm. Oh, you know, I mean, think of it. Tailoring didn't have a measuring tape until, you know, uh, the 1800s, mm. like an actual measuring tape with numbers on it. So imagine it was a felt culture. It was an mm. eyeball culture. And it... It's much like those German archaeologists. Uh, I think his name was Winkler. They went and started measuring everything and trying to find a mathematical formula for why these rooms look so beautiful. But there was no mathematical f- formula, you know. Uh, I think I don't know if you're a Palladian scar- scholar, you might argue with me. But um, but I think that's an important thing to, to recognize is that my father was of a generation where you just wore the clothes, right? And you felt good in Instinctively. it. Instinctively, yeah, and you look good in it, and you act. You acted with swagger. You know, now we talk about... I mean, who talked about swagger in the 1970s? No one had swag. No one walked into a room with swagger, right? Swag was a porno magazine, <laughs> and that was it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so that we're more... We're hyper male now. We're actually too attentive and concerned about what it means to be a, a great-looking guy or a good man or, a, you know, a manly man. We're, we're very... You know, magazines... I mean, maybe they've, maybe they've always done it, but I think that my father was a real natural man, like for all his faults. I mean, he was a wife beater, a dog killer, a drunk, and a depressive. He was a man. Like, he really was a guy. Like, he was a real man in a way that I still can't um, be like him. And maybe I shouldn't. Maybe we shouldn't, you know, because it, it, it tore him up a bit. It seems like a classic Canadian story. The classic Canadian story is, is the immigrant story. How much of your father's story do you think is, is that kind of immigrant challenges of an immigrant to, to, uh, to Canada on the make type story? No, we've had so many generations of immigration since my father came to Canada. I feel really reluctant to generalize because the experiences of mainland Chinese people is to me seems very different from what my father experienced. Mm. Like my father grew up in Sherbrooke, Quebec. He grew up, his first North American language was actually French, wow. not English. Uh, he could swear just like, like, people would be in shock when they heard him speak oh. French because oh. they couldn't believe the fluency in which he, he spoke mm. it. Um, so that, and that's different. Like the immigration experience is so different from that. Like my father really, he was first generation mm. Canadian and he assimilated Big time. First generation Canadians now don't have to assimilate. There was just this is, this is not necessary, and so I, I I do think his struggle would be of interest to to other 
immigrants or family, you know, children of immigrants. But I don't know how to. Uh, I've never done a you know a cross cultural study or cross generational study. I just think there's something really in- interesting about immigration now mm. that I don't even understand. Mm. Uh, so I would never presume. But definitely, he had a tale that's really attractive. Like it is a, a tale of struggle. I don't know if it's generational or if it's class based mm. or if it is race or culture based or immigration based. But he definitely saw, you know, he was working at the Dragon Room restaurant at the age of 13. He, um, you know, he, he didn't grow up with his own family. He didn't know how to be a father because of that because he didn't really have a father himself. You know, he's a self made man uh, and he really struggled. So um, I'm not sure, you know, if that's typical anymore. I think there are examples of that. And I do worry about broken families. You know, in, in 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 coming generations, because there's not enough communication between families, and just not enough of families being together, mm. uh, and that might be the ultimate immigrant tale. If you think about the English, uh, the young English children that came to Canada to work on farms, mm. parenting when they did they themselves never had parents, right. it's, it's heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, reading your father's stories, he's got a wife, a kids, robust income by 24. I'm 28, and I'm nowhere near that. You know what I mean? That's, is that just generational, or is it the, the, some, an immigrant might have a little more of the fire to, to achieve than someone born in North America? I mean, there's, there's so many differences between his place, his life story, and someone who's his, you know, who's 24, say, today. Uh, but yet there's, yet there's still something recognizable you know I, I mean that's what you look for when you're writing someone else's story right I mean the, what do you what do you think people tap into when they hear your father's story I think they find him despite all the violence in his life and his his flaws I find I think they see him through my eyes and they they're attracted to him uh, I've always been attracted to my father I've always just been in absolute wonder and and he was always mythic to me, and I never lost that feeling. It, it may, or rather, when I got older, when he couldn't live up to his own myth, I begrudged him oh. his, his, his fault, you know, I for see. failing me on that level. Right. Because I really did mythologize him. He was bigger than life. And I didn't know the bad things that were happening in our life were actually bad. Right. It's only in retrospect. Right. Some of that stuff just was like, okay, he's drunk. Okay, he's going to be under the ping pong table. Mm-hmm. But there were, and even feeling awful and terrible and sad... Uh, at those moments was just part of it. Your own life story has its early chapters in Montreal. You read about them in the book, and now you're over here in Vancouver. Which of the cities do you think holds better claim to the title of men's style capital of Canada? Oh, Montreal does. It's such a beautiful... Montreal has an incredible menswear culture. Some of the earliest clothes from Italy, I'm talking about the, the designers, right? came in through Montreal uh, there were some really fine stores they still are they're still there and they were really innovative and so and, and there was just a, a, a really knowledgeable European influence culture there the clothes was always around you know uh, people could read French folk French L easily and then there was a Quebec version of L as well that was very had different they all had different covers right and so uh, that clothing your like europe looks and europe attitudes european attitudes were really just they were everywhere and so the menswear culture was there i remember i mean le chateau which i don't know if is in the states or not uh was the first zara or the first h&m they were kind of copying what was on the runway and you could find really like i remember we're getting a pinch of le chateau crepe sort of crepey pants multiple like triple triple pleats oh, flared wow. out and then pegged at the bottom wow. and it, it was a zouave kind of a zouave oh, pant circa i'm talking 1980s here i'm not talking like like last year or five years <laughs> no ago doubt. not 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 the harem pant but it was a male harem pant right. you know my i stole my sister's jod pores no, and i don't know if anyone wore i, I don't know if jod pores were really in north america <laughs> anywhere but they were in montreal i see like you could wear jod pores and pointy pointy shoes, and that was that was a look. So Montreal, I mean, that, that's me as a kid, right? So uh, that's there. That was definitely in the culture and definitely out there in Montreal, and and I, it's still a grand city to walk down. Toronto is kind of fascinating now. They're really they doesn't got, have style. <sighs> I was impressed. Like I was really impressed by the way young men dress in uh, Toronto. Mm. 
it reminded me of Georgetown in Washington. Oh, yeah. It's a bit textbook. Mm -hmm. Like there's a certain look, mm -hmm. right? And all the kids are doing it, mm -hmm. right? Like there was like I when I was in Georgetown in 2005, there were so many beards, like just so many young men in beards, like right. a very particular beard, not the beard that we well may actually very much like the beard that we see now. But 2005 was like they were all the kids were doing it. It was one look, and they were all in a beard. And uh, in Toronto, you saw the guy in a skinny suit with the really nice brown shoes and the skinny right. jeans, so a nice jacket. It looked like a broken, it wasn't really a sports coat because some of them were striped, but they were like a an odd jacket jean pairing right. with a pointy or a pointier nice lace-up shoe brown weathered mm -hmm. very nice look but there were a lot of guys doing it mm -hmm. and it was so was it, it but no i love it it's funny thing is i feel like like a country mouse being a west coaster mm -hmm. and i always thought that i would be easily outdressed in cities like that even new york and uh i'm very competitive <laughs> i was very proud of myself that i was able to Maybe because I was quirky, but uh, I was able to stand out in cities like that. Like people would talk to me because of the way I was dressed in those cities. Mm, you know? I see. I see. No, Which I love. I'm right. so vain that I love this. Right. Um, I understand. Yeah, it's it's I I aspire to get to that level one day. So I'm glad to know that conversations are starting for you yeah. based on the way you dress. It's I love it. I love it. I love like women. Just you know, they're just always touching my clothes mm. and. If I let them, right. and uh, and I love that too, and and it's a really it's funny it's it's I just love it. I don't know why. I, I mean, there's a chapter in the book I describe where I'm working at, at Modernized Tailors, which is just a block away from us, as an apprentice tailor, and I went to New York to visit uh, the uh, the Duke of Windsor's clothes at the Costume Institute in the Metropolitan Museum, and for that trip I made a pair of jeans, and they were like. They were precision engineered. Like they were, they were jeans. Yes. They were for me, no one else. And in a in a great city, a grand city, uh, I'm on Madison Avenue and in a breakfast place, uh, you know, across from the Met, down, you know, just down the way, right, mm -hmm. uh, a bit more east of it. And people started talking to me about my clothes. And I think they, anyways, it was cool. Like it was just like you know to be in New York and to be thought of being something right. in a town where you're totally intimidated. Everything's so big and so beautiful, and it's just the way you imagined it. And to be um, still be you know treated as if you belong there was kind of an awesome feeling. And clothes, that's and isn't that really the secret of clothes? Like isn't that what my dad was talking about? Isn't that what? And it doesn't cost a lot of money, but you certainly have to look like a million dollars, right? And yes. you have to feel like a million dollars, right? You don't have to spend it, but you got to feel it. Mm. And uh, I think that's all he really wanted me is to be able to navigate a man's world mm. and the world, the public world, where you stand forth and say, "Look, you know, I need you to trust me. I need you to believe me. Mm. I need you to come with me and do something important." Mm. You need to be dressed a certain way to get that, to command that respect. Right. Uh, and because you're acknowledging your need of them. I mean, dressing in a suit is an acquiescence, right? You're actually giving in your autonomy to say, look, I will wear this because I need to acknowledge that you have power over me. But now you need to let me take you somewhere. I think that's really, that's what it means to be a public person, isn't it? And to, to negotiate and to bring others with you is to stand forth and, and do and express yourself and clothing is part of that storytelling and that that request to be together to do something together mm. that said tell me a little bit about the public style you see in vancouver here I, i've always regarded it as a city better dressed than the one i grew up in seattle but that's not saying a whole lot when you look around seattle uh but i mean i have a friend here i'm staying with who was saying, geez, I haven't worn a collared shirt since I've been in Vancouver. Uh, or they talk about the influence of, say, a, a Lululemon on sort of yoga-fying the, the general dress of people. What, what do you see on the streets here? I never thought I was a butt man, <laughs> but I am. And so I really, I mean, like some of these girls, these young women, they look, I mean, there's not left much for the imagination and, sure. and you know, uh, but it, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, oh my God, like I know exactly... And I, you know, on a prurient level, I can't say no to that. Like, you know, it, I don't think it's terribly expressive. This, I mean, it's very casual. It's not the most expressive clothing. It's not the most creative solution. Uh, but for a body culture, a yoga culture, 
It is fascinating. I mean, it really, it's, you're down, it's sort of like Marlon Brando's t-shirt, right? right? Like you're really, you're down to the bottom. Like you're just down to the, the, the bare fact of the body. Right. right. And that to me, I'm not anti-body. Like I like skimpy Olympian, like in the, in the Olympics, I thought, you know, like the skimpier the volleyball uniforms, the better, <laughs> uh, you know, if runners want to, if you want to box without the penny, you know, like the national right. pennies, like I think that would be great if people could box without a jersey on. Mm. It's a good example. So I'm a, I'm not against physical culture, and actually that, that's why I mean we're pushing for the tighter suit. But what is that about? But except bringing up the body and, and showing more form and shape, and to give it that sort of martial, feral, not buried under you know like we want it to be lean and mean, right? And and so uh, so okay. I don't like the casualness though of the city. Let's go back to the Vancouver thing. I do think. Uh, that the wavelength or the the range of expression in dress is too limiting mm. or that there's too much opting out and that the idea of theater of the city I love people like you know the idea of um, a butcher and a proper smock right. you know it's a beautiful thing Roger Chautauk in the banquet years mm. writes that everybody in Paris wore was like were actors on a stage and they all, each had their costume yes. from the waiters to the bartenders to the butcher and the bread maker mm. and um and I kind of, that's Belle Epoque France we're talking. Yes. And, and so I would like to see that. You know, I love seeing a smartly dressed waiter. Like, mm, yes. you, know, bad, you know, I like to see, it like, be nice to see a smartly dressed customer as right. well. Yeah. <laughs> you want to see people really living there, the roles that they're in in the moment, right? You want to see them committing. Yeah, even if it's like, you know, one day you're wearing a suit because you have to be this guy. And the next, I don't know what the idea of truth in clothing is all about. Like this obsession with, I need to, I need to be myself. Right. You know, um, because that's sort of a self obsessive, self obsessive behavior in mm-hmm. a way. I had a, a friend who's a lawyer. Oh, I mean, actually, he's not a friend. He's actually a second cousin. It's very complicated. <laughs> it's uh, he's my great aunt's daughter's husband. Mm-hmm. So I'm not really sure. I mean, he's lovely. He's a lawyer, young man. Mm-hmm. And we started talking about the nature of suit wearing. And I said, you know, you can actually express how you feel about others through the way you dress like yeah. if you want to if you want clothes to be about self-expression if you want your clothes to be about self-expression it can actually express how you feel about somebody else right. and that can be one of those forms is re- ex- things that you can express is respect mm. it's- you know and that's self-expression still it's not about your inner soul <laughs> right but I mean you wouldn't want to watch a movie about your inner soul anyways right, yeah. so why do you want your clothes to tell the story about your inner soul mm. it's the, yeah. it brings a quote to mind a, a book called, you may maybe read it called just it's just called the suit I think who wrote it his real name is Mike Anton I think he's it's like a parody of Machiavelli though so he calls himself Nicholas Anton Giovanni and it's a whole treatise on suit wearing and he talks about how men got dumber about clothes, and he says, you know, somewhere in the 60s, 70s, we just gave into the pious demand that, or we piously started demanding that we be judged not by what we wear, but by, in, in quotes, who we are. And I'm thinking, yeah, it's like, what is what is more who we are than how we choose to present ourselves? You know what I mean? There's that's that is who we are, right? Yeah, it's sort of that whole uh, action speaks louder than words, or intent, or. Um, praxis over Lexus, right? Ah, okay. So action over words is an important idea. And when we talk about that period of time when people, you know, thought that that they could that they could be read, that their soul or who they were could be understood, is really false because we actually appear in the world and we drift by really quickly mm. and we're actually you know we're submerged in our clothes anyways right. and there's no interiority that can be exposed through your clothes mm. right? right you can merely wear the plumage that you choose to wear mm. uh, the bird is an orange because inside it is orange <laughs> it's orange yes. right it's orange it's just orange because it's orange it's not because its insides are orange mm. Right, and so in many ways, like this idea of being able to take our clothes and make it some sort of inside-out representation of who we are, mm. uh, is false. Now, that that brings up an interesting question, which I cannot solve for you. Mm. What does it mean to wear this outside stuff on the outside? Yeah. I'm not really sure, but obviously, it is a t- it's a barrier. It's um, it's a permeable barrier. Mm. So what it is is it actually is both the 
inside pushing out and the outside, the world around us, our environment, the culture pushing in towards us. And there's a beautiful bird <laughs> keeping don't, away don't above see us. Where it, what, oh, He's right there. There we are. Oh, I was hoping that it would be a purple finch, and then we could talk about the nature of the purple finch. Uh, and it's, well, but, but there you go. If only. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, the purple finch doesn't uh, worry whether or not his soul is purple or red. It's actually rosy red, but, uh, you know, on the inside, he just is purple. And I think men can look at the suit as as that, as that, like, like that very effective, efficient coating plumage that they can adapt and use when they need to not be afraid of it that's the real problem is that men are afraid of suits the reason why we're so attentive to suits is that we're still afraid of them even though we're we have incredible precise knowledge about how to wear them and how we should have kissing buttons and, the, and that it's surgeon's cuffs and that oh you know they shouldn't have pleats or they should have pleats and you know what we're still like I smell fear that's what I dislike that even with all our great strides in menswear men still dress defensively mm. dressed because they're afraid we still try to build up that knowledge as a shield as well yeah and I and and, and, and I'm not and so that's we're here I'm about to contradict myself maybe you know um, like I, I do think that dress can be more I'm not sure what it is but I know it can be more than that mm. and that's why I talk about me you know being idiosyncratic and all those things and how I take great pleasure in that and and I really do hope men do that too because actually they'll be more comfortable in their own skin like they'll actually become comfortable in their own skin you sent some of the action of the book of measure of man in at, uh, at modernized taylor where their current location is is near here as you mentioned you give the impression in the book that vancouver tailoring culture is not as robust as it once was is that true no it's true there were many more tailors in this city maybe seven eight in just chinatown i'm talking about there were seven or eight more tailors that all did it and they were all active Modernized is the last. Now, there are the old Chinese tailors on the periphery still, but they're not technically part of Chinatown anymore, and they actually can't make suits anymore. They're not oh, capable. Really? They're just alterationists now. Oh. Or they're sort of a... They front... Um, they're the old guys. Like, those are the guys. Like, they may have even worked at, at Modernized, but uh, they don't make suits anymore. They alter stuff, and they're really fronts for dry cleaning operations now. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, they just pick up your clothes, they send yeah. it off, and they bring it back, and, and that's it. But yeah, there's maybe four, you know I don't know them all, and it's hard to. I'm not really in the in the market for a suit these days, so I don't I don't know everybody in the business or anything. But yeah, it's a it declined trade. Strangely enough, though, if you are a well trained tailor, you can still find work. Really? You can always find work anywhere. Like, and I still believe that if you're a really good tailor, you don't have to worry. Mm. You know, you never. I don't think you. If you might be terrible at marketing, and that might be your top problem. Right. But the problem is you, that your skill is not wanted. It's just that, you know, it's, it's funny is that the people are quite demanding on tailors now because the men are really fashion sensitive, but they know nothing about how clothes is made. Oh, yes. And so there's this great conflict of cultures. It's like, you know, like men don't know how to be in a tailor or walk into a tailor shop or, mm. or figure out if they're the right tailor for them. And I get queries about oh do you think bill and jack can make clothes for me he's like yeah i don't know if you'll like it like i don't know if you'll get along with them i don't know if you'll agree like that's like uh it is a personal relationship you have to have yeah yeah it's like you're asking me if they should be their your lover like i don't know like why don't you go in and ask them right you know and uh that's a problem that's a that's a i have a really difficult time answering who's the best tailor in town is the guy you know you need to trust them like you need to figure it out yourself and you need to, like, I always say, like, you know, get your pants hemmed. Right. And then maybe get something that's really fat on you and get it, you know, taken in on the sides and see what happens. Right. You know, and then work your way into a relationship with them. Because at some point, you do clash, crash into the house style of the tailor. Right. And if you don't simpatico with that, nothing, you're not going to get them to do it for you. Mm. And then you're just going to get into big arguments. <laughs> I live in Los Angeles' Koreatown in part because there's so many tailors working there in walking distance of me and I was getting measured up for a suit at one recently one that seemed to have the same sensibility as me and it did I did get a little bit sad in thinking there's a lot of men of the last couple of generations who have not had this experience you know, you know that feeling like there have been a lot, a lot of guys have missed out on something that seems quintessential about being a, a man since tailoring was invented right? I, I really talk about the intimacy of a tailor's touch in the book. 
and how when Bill first worked with me and sort of, you know, sh- found the shape of my shoulders and, you know, figured it that I, that I, uh, that I hung left, you know, or I had a certain weight uh, on one side of my crotch, you know, those are all really, first of all, really private, intimate acts, but it's also one of the few occasions, especially for a straight male, right? Of like an old, a man of an older generation being intimate, physically intimate with you. And we miss out on even just that simple gesture of someone patting you on the back, like an old man patting you on the back. I didn't have that. I lost my father, right? And my grandparents were far away. So that's a good example of that sort of distance. And that, that that old culture of the tailor brings that brings you back in contact with that sort of simple, paternal esque type of touch and communication with another man. That's really quite wonderful. And and just the care, if you have a good tailor, like some people will just bang out a suit for you, and then you're stuck with it. Uh, and so you really have to find a person who's. I think tailors. There are tailors who just t- you know are terrible. They're not happy people. And then there are tailors who sew with great love. And if you find that person, they should be your tailor. You know, you know, I think that's what you need. And it's a wonderful experience. It's, it's, it's. Think of going to a really great bar, old school barber who will actually, you know, shave you with a straight razor, right. and like multiply that by times ten, and that's kind of what develops between you and a great tailor. Do you think it's essential to wear something that fits? perfectly just so you physically know what that means it sounds like i'm answering a question i'm asking a question whose answer was obviously yes but is that something you believe i think that's interesting have i worn a you're asking me something have i worn a truly great suit or it's kind of because i actually something I made not, for you I, you know i i kind of like my i never presume that i know everything about menswear right or maybe i do but i apologize <laughs> for any presumptions uh you know i'm a bit of a like I said, a lot of men are cargo cult people, yes. which means they worship at only the reconstruction mm-hmm. of the thing. So there are people who are just naturally able to wear Savile Row clothing right. and buy it and have it around them. And they know exactly what it means to wear a custom built, bespoke, mm-hmm. beautifully fitted suit. Quite now, a I, sense of aristocracy there, right? Yeah, there is. That's for sure. I think that... Um, when we talk about wearing a great fitting suit, we, we do our best, right? And that's always going to be, I'm, always, I'm deficient in that way. But I do believe you need to feel comfortable in it. And at least, no, I, th- there, I think the suit I'm wearing has lots of flaws in it, but I don't really care. I think it's shapely. I think from a certain distance, as uh, Anne Hollander said in Sex and Suits, you know, from a certain distance, the suit looks correct. So it is correct. Right. And, you know, it's only a certain type of person that can get really close to you and begin to see maybe the, 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 the flaws in it. But majority won't. And so uh, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't get too wound up. I think, like, even a narrowed sleeve, a narrowed sleeve, you could, you know, a smaller armhole is a huge triumph for a lot of men. Oh, yes. And, you know, a nice suppressed waist mm. is a huge triumph. They can just get that. Right. A vent that doesn't flare open, you <laughs> yes, know, yes, would yes. be an amazing accomplishment. So I look for little things now. I'm not looking for, you know, a guy to walk down the street and be perfect. I don't want to make garish mistakes. Like, I don't want to see him all buttoned up or anything. Yeah, yeah, but, every, every button. Because, <laughs> you know, that's what, like, you know, the guy who can afford the perfectly fitted suit will just button all the buttons. And then it's like, you know, so I'd rather, you know, like you have a bit of savoir faire. You might not be able to get the perfect, perfect fit, but at least if you know what you're doing, you're going to look good, right? Because right. you can spend $5,000, $10,000 on a suit, and then you're going to do something stupid with your button. <laughs> or you're going to wear a pocket square that's so perfectly folded that it has four little points on it and makes right. you look like you're wearing a doily. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, and your tie knot has no, you know, it's like just stand, the dimple is in the middle. It's perfectly in the middle. And, you know, it's just, it's, everything's boring. Mm. You know, there, nothing's going on. Everything's just wrong or too, either too wrong or too right, you know? Mm. Uh, so, yeah, if you, if I just think you can't be afraid. That's the most important thing. And I don't know how to, I don't know how men can get there except, except to get comfortable with the clothes they have, alter it as much as they can until they feel comfortable and just keep at it I I think I'm lucky I alter my own clothes I've learned enough I can never be an actual tailor because I'm not fast enough but I can alter my own clothes Mm. I'll cut the hems I'll change the sleeve heads I'll redo the lining 
but it's a mess. It's always a mess. Like you can't open my coat. Not it looks like it looks like yeah, six. You know, it looks like surgery's been done on it. It looks like Frankenstein on the inside. My Another facet of gearheadism, though, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I suppose it is. I mean, I try not to do it too much. I just do it when I, I if I have to do a public event, I try to get a, a new suit going. Like I, I'll revive a suit, or I'll I'll change it. I'll get rid of the vent, or I'll, I'll do something different. It. That's for me just to stay real and to be grounded in the book and the subject matter still and still be a person that sews. Uh, because I am – funny enough, I am a better sewer than I, I was when before uh, – from the time when I was fired. So I've actually become a better at making clothes since I was fired uh, from Modernize as an Apprentice, which is – another thread of the story in the book yes indeed you focus uh, we've talked about and you focus a bit in the measure of a man on how your father prepared you for the man's world as he understood it now how do you think about preparing your sons for the man's world as it is in the 21st century i'm thinking about it a lot right now i'm working on a series of essays that explore the idea of me leaving a legacy of ideas for my children just in case I kick it at the age of 52. Right. And uh, I've written some of it's to capture our relationship as it was at this really special time. They're both nine right now. My, Jack, my boys are Jack and Emmett. They're twins. And they're just, they're marvels. They're just, I'm amazed by them. I love them so much. I want to kill them. Like, I really want to, like, I can, sometimes, like, I get really angry and I pick them up and I go, oh, I think I wanted to throw you through the wall there. Like, I just, I need to put you back down. Yes. And it's not, you know, it's supposed to, like, all the books say don't pick up your child when you're angry. Mm. Just don't. And uh, it's a good point. Uh, you know, and, and so I still have a, you know, I wanted them to, to have them understand, like, some of the anger management issues that I have that are a legacy of my father's. Mm. You know, and not to dump it all in hell. I'm quite sure I'm at fault for, for my own, own reasons because I'm just a brutish man. But, um, <laughs> but, um, so I want to. So I am working on this real interesting exploration about what it means to be a father and what it means to leave a legacy for your children, mm. no, no matter how meager, like you know, it, materially it is. Like what kind of, you know, what does what does a writer leave his child? Mm. You know, what can you know? All I have are, is what I can write. It's the only way I, I can make. Seems it seems these days I can make any money, mm. and uh, it makes me worry because I'm trained as an architect. I was a painter. You know, I, I feel I'm a good broadcaster and a good communicator, but all those things are sort of disappearing from my life, and writing's becoming more and more dominant. But it makes me worry because it's such a lonely activity, and it, and it's very internal. Even if it, if you're writing about r the world around you or reporting about the world around you, so this book is going to be my little time capsule, message in a bottle, right. my future self talking to my past self, or my past self talking to the future, my future children. Mm. So I'm really looking forward to it, and I'm very close. Like uh, I'm working on it. And the next book hopefully should force you out in the theater of the streets a little more, right? Maybe, yeah. You know, you know what the best thing that ever happened is I went on book tour. Oh, like, yeah. yeah, I got to see a lot of different cities, and it made me more confident about what what I wrote about clothing mm. was correct because I, I I felt really good about the way I was dressed, uh, and I felt like you know like I could hold I could hold my own in you know fairly decent world class cities with the way I dress and it's like okay you know like I guess I wasn't deluded that actually maybe there you know what I say can hold some authority maybe not a lot I'm not an expert or a historian or you know I don't run a fashion magazine but I, I most certainly believe that I was a you know that um, I, I'm glad I got out of the house <laughs> let's just put it that way and 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 I I'd also discovered uh, my you know that I have a story to tell that's about the journey of being a memoirist something I, I, that doesn't get talked a lot about in the press because it's usually in my talks is that how much the, the writing of the book changed me and I evolved through the writing and so six months after writing the book you sort of finally decompress and begin to understand what you created and I, I have this really different profound understanding of my relationship with my father and it's changed my life and and it changed my interactions with people and I'm a yes person 100% now and I really I'm really about um, I want to give as much as I can give to the community and the people around me I never say no I try not to say no I'm always saying yes I, I do I try to fight that urge to say no well you're sitting right here aren't you you said no, yes to this this is easy you're going to help me sell books <laughs> yes that's true. That's true. the book by the way is The Measure of a Man uh, the story of a, fa of a father a son and a suit 
I've been speaking here in uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen Gardens in Chinatown, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, with J.J. Lee, who writes about menswear. He's written about menswear for the Vancouver Sun and the National Post. He has spoken about menswear on the CBC, and you'll hear much more from him on the subject of suits, fatherhood, and more. J.J., thanks so much. Thank you very much. It was lovely. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to everybody who backed Season 3 on Kickstarter, including Paige Calvert, Jonathan Crow, Douglas Dollars, Paul Doyle, John French, Eric Graham, Will Graham, Humberto Grant, Kimberly Hahn, Carl Haley, Stefan Halperin, Matt Howie, Andrew Hovenick, Mark Hines, Andy Cooney, Mark Larson, Matthew Licky, Mr. Munvirzi, Rob Montz, Lindsay Muniak, Daniel Murphy, Aidan Nolman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Danny Olson, Michael O'Regan, Blake Riley, Rob Schultz, Cam Smith, Small Demons, Todd Shimoda, Kevin Smokler, Thomas Unterberger, Matt Warren, and Wayne Wright.